Hey guys, this is Richard. I'm going to start our presentation today uh, with an introduction to the Seminole Whitetail Deer and also provide a brief overview of Everglades habitat. Last year I had the opportunity to attend rendezvous in Boise and upon introducing myself as a hunter from Florida, I had a lot of folks ask me what I hunted in Florida and they were all pretty surprised when my answer was an alligator. Despite being known for our, our fishing opportunities, there's actually a lot of great hunting opportunities here in Florida, some of which Mark and I will describe in this presentation. White-tailed deer are the most popular game species in Florida, and it's estimated hunters spend about $700 million a year in our state chasing them. Here in Florida, we have four subspecies of the white-tail that live within the state. The Gulf Coast whitetail, which lives primarily in the Panhandle. The Southeastern whitetail, which creeps in from Georgia around the northeast corner of the state. The Key Deer, which live exclusively in the Florida Keys. And the Seminole whitetail, or uh, what's also uh, called the Florida whitetail, uh, which occupies South Florida and the coastal areas along the Atlantic side. Today, Mark and I are, are going to focus... Uh, specifically on the Seminole Whitetail, uh, but uh, even more specifically in South Florida and the Everglades region in which we hunt. I wanted to begin by taking a brief look at history of deer in Florida and the Everglades. Prior to European contact, Florida was broadly inhabited by Native Americans and Every archaeological site containing animal bones uh, also contained deer bones. This slide here uh, depicts an engraving from the 1500s illustrating one of the techniques that Florida natives used to stalk deer. As with many of our game species throughout the country, market and subsistence hunting prior to 1900 were were the biggest threats to the white-tailed deer. By the early 20th century, they were nearly wiped out in South Florida. Hunting regulations uh, introduced in the early part of the century helped deer populations, uh, but in 1933, the New World screwworm fly broke out in South Florida and it had pretty devastating effects on the deer population here. Uh, additionally, in, in 1939, there was a deer eradication program Im implemented uh, that culled nearly 10,000 deer between 1939 and 1943. It was believed that the white-tailed deer were the carriers of the tick that caused cattle tick fever. Florida has a rich uh, ranching history and cattle was a major part of Florida's economy during the uh, early part of the 20th century. Florida currently ranks as the 12th largest beef producer in the United States and much of that ranch land habitat is really important to wildlife today. Deer populations reached their lowest in the 1940s alongside major development in our state. In response, the Florida Game and Freshwater Fish Commission, now the Florida Wildlife Commission, created the Wildlife Management Area System. Uh, they also implemented stricter harvest rules, which included defined seasons and buck-only harvest. They also started some translocation programs to get deer back into area where they had been uh, depleted. By 1951, deer numbers were believed to be uh, between 45,000 and 50,000. The screw worm, uh, which was responsible for limiting growth of deer herds in South Florida, was actually eradicated in 1958. In 1959, the commission's management area system grew to over 4 million acres of wildlife habitat. During the 1960s, Deer numbers continued to increase as arrests for game violations also dramatically increased. Numbers continued to grow in the 1970s and 80s, and 1985 marked the first time in Florida's recorded history that white-tailed deer harvest exceeded 100,000. 
If you talk to hunters about the 70s and 80s, they will definitely describe hunting in Florida back then as the good old days. The 90s, however, were a little hard on the deer herd here in South Florida. Restoration efforts and hydrological changes definitely had a negative impact. Today, the deer herd in South Florida uh, has somewhat low population densities, which is also uh, due in part to the reintroduction and recovery of panther populations, as well as uh, the introduction of invasive predators such as the Burmese python and, and coyotes. Despite the lower success rate we have today, the Everglades still offers a very unique opportunity to hunt the Seminole whitetail in a subtropical environment only found in the swamps and marshes of South Florida. Most folks, when they think of the Everglades, imagine a sawgrass marsh and uh, might not envision how a deer could live in that stuff, nor how one could hunt in that environment. But the greater Everglades ecosystem incorporate numerous habitats, which I'll highlight. But uh, first, I want to describe what makes uh, the Seminole whitetail so unique. Those of you who are familiar with deer in Florida may know one thing. Our deer are small. And frankly, I'm, o I'm okay with that. <laughs> I, if I had to pack out a 300-pound animal during archery season down here in August, uh, it might kill me. Uh, some of you are familiar with Bergman's rule, which states that the closer you are to the equator, the smaller body size of an animal becomes. Um, males down here average around 115 pounds and uh, does around 90 pounds. As you move from the southernmost portions of the state on up, uh, this, their size does increase slightly. The smaller size further south is partly due to nutrient-poor soil soils that contribute to low nutritional value in the available forage. One thing that makes our deer very unique, uh, especially in the southernmost portion of the state, is they will breed year-round. We do have a peak rut that varies throughout the state, but fawns can drop it at any time of the year. Um, our rut down in, in South Florida in the Everglades area um, is usually around the end of July. And uh, depending on, on where you are in South Florida, it could be uh, July. It could be, um, it can go all the way to, to September. And, and we also, you know, we see chasing throughout the year. So it's, uh, it's not shocking to, to, see, to see chasing in June or, or even May. Um, this is also true of antler growth. There's a, there's a general cycle, um, but uh, for example, in Big Cypress National Preserve, where I do most of my deer hunting, um, you can see them uh, and you know, the hard horns can be seen as early as June, typically July. Uh, antlers drop as early as December but um, typically they lose them around January, February. So I'm going to touch briefly on habitat to give you some perspective on the type of environment and plant communities we have in, uh, here in South Florida. We could go down a rabbit hole really um, if I tried to lay everything out, but um, there are some key environments I think I should point out. As you know, here in South Florida, there isn't a whole lot of elevation. So if you're used to hunting uh, river bottoms and hills and mountains, uh, you're in for a surprise down here. Um, you know, in Big Cypress, I'm, I'm basically walking in about eight inches of water to, to knee to thigh deep uh, from, you know, the minute I get out of my truck to my stand. So I just wanted to sort of give you guys a kind of basic 101 understanding of how South Florida works or functions. And uh, on the left-hand side, this is, this is the historical uh, sort of chart or map of, of the habitats we have down here. And uh, on the right side uh, is what it looks like today. Um, 
you know, half of the Everglades are gone. Uh, they're, they're, you know, urban areas or they're farmlands, um, but they are gone. Um, but the half that remains still uh, resembles, uh, in, in the most part, what they were in historic times. And um, if you'll look at the map on the left, you'll sort of see like a layout of like what the the major uh, habitat areas are. And, uh, you know, when most folks come down here, they, they probably go on an airboat ride through the sawgrass prairies. And, and that's what you see there uh, described as the ridge and slough habitat or the sawgrass plains habitat. And that's really um, sort of like where the big like sheet flow coming down from Lake Okeechobee feeding into Florida Bay. Um, when you think of that, that's that's really that's really that that river of grass that that we refer to. Those areas on the on the on the sides of the of the of the Shark River um, are a bit higher. Um, they're a little more elevated, and um, that's there uh, where you see the big cypress on the left and the eastern flatwoods on the right and the uh, Atlantic coastal ridge uh, there along the, the the Atlantic side, which is basically um, all of Miami-Dade and Palm Beach and uh, and Broward County now. So here in South Florida, uh, habitat habitats change uh, not within uh, thousands of feet of elevation, um, but within inches or feet of elevation. Uh, you know, every, the water uh, down here determines everything, and that's where uh, the different habitat uh, types uh, are born. Um, the pond and slough habitat, um, th these are going to be your deepest areas. The wet prairie is going to be a little more shallow. This is, you know, anywhere from, from a foot to, to four to six feet. Um, the sawgrass marsh is, it's, you know, around the same four to six feet. Um, but then you get into, um, the swamps, which are, they can have lower parts in the centers of the swamps, but, you know, you're usually talking about a foot of water. And, uh, as you get up into uplands and, and drier areas, that's where you get into, um, you know, like the pine flatwoods and the hardwood hammocks. So I wanted to outline uh, or break down um, those sawgrass areas uh, and where the deer live in those sawgrass areas. And the tree islands are, are really important to their habitat out there. Uh, this is basically the high ground. This is where they're bedding. Um, they'll, they'll travel through the marshes, um, especially during our dry season. But those tree islands are, are pretty critical um, to the ha to deer habitat or, or any fur bearing uh, habitat in the Everglades. And um, a lot of that is under threat uh, today, especially in our central Everglades, where um, a lot of water is being held, uh, you know, basically for flood control, uh, for water quality control and, um, you know, for for all the different uses now that we have here. This is a satellite image of that ridge and slough uh, habitat. You see there the tree islands and um, you can see them. They're almost, you know, they're, they're like teardrop shape uh, due to the water flow. Um, that water's always moving. It's, it's flowing from Lake Okeechobee, like I said, down a, down a Florida Bay and it doesn't look like it's moving, but, uh, it's moving. And that's, uh, you know, also why we, we call it a river of grass. So as we get more into our uplands, um, those pine areas, those hardwood, hardwood hammock areas, um, the cypress, the, the sawgrass prairies, um, they become uh, the dominant feature, uh, especially as you get like into Big Cypress or up along the East Coast or the uh, Eastern Everglades um, are going to be more dominated um, by those 
upland habitats. And uh, like I said, with the ridge and slough uh, about the tree islands, those, those drier areas are, are critical habitats. They feed in, in those wet habitats, but, but they need those drier areas uh, for their bedding and uh, for fawns as well, fawn survival. This is uh, basically um, the type of terrain uh, we're hunting in. This is uh, a marl prairie that you're looking at, um, surrounded by pines. And uh, this is basically uh, one of the trails to, to one of my stands. It took me about two seasons, and, and you can see um, the trail's pretty well defined. Underneath all that grass there is probably about, uh, that whole prairie is, is probably about 8 inches, 8 or 10 inches of water throughout that, that whole prairie. And then once you get up into the pines there, then it gets a little drier. This is a satellite view of, of sort of what that habitat looks like. You see there we've got those dark green areas. Those are the, the pines and... Uh, if you see these little islands here, these are all these are all cypress domes, and uh, in between here, these are all prairies. So these are sort of like in the in the drier areas when we talk about uh, hunting, like the eastern Everglades or big cypress. This is basically uh, the terrain that we're in. This this is pretty much the type of stuff that I hunt in. So you know the deer are going to be bedded in these areas, but they love, you know, they love moving through these cypress. They'll cross these prairies in the in the early mornings or, or you know, or right at dusk. Um, they're feeding on on lots of plants that that live within this wetter stuff. But um, but they oh they also depend on those pine islands for a place to go to sleep. So I also wanted to give you guys a sense of what our dry season and, and wet season are, is like here and uh, it can be a pretty dramatic change you may see some deer or you may see a lot of sign during turkey season and you may think man this is a great spot for deer and, and you come back there um, you know a few months later and all of a sudden everything's different and uh, I just wanted to give you guys a sense of, of you know what the impact was between our wet and dry season this here on this satellite this is this is the wet season here and then this is the dry season of, of the same um, shot here and you can see um, you know where that water remains or just in those deepest spots those you know you can see those dark areas and uh, you know the wildlife are they're going to be drawn to that stuff as, as it gets down and gets down into the drier times and it's usually our peak or our the peak of the wet season is usually september and then it by you know by may we get pretty dry and then june around june it'll start raining and it pretty much won't stop till till uh november this right here is uh an example of a prairie on the left um I went out in May to set some cameras up and I came back in, in June and this is just a month difference and there's a foot of water on the landscape and, and all it takes is, you know, a week of real heavy rain and, and, you know, it'll just go right from our dry season, just flat right into the wet season real quick. And, uh, just want to give you guys a sense of, of, you know, the, what the terrain's like and and what you know how we're trying to hunt it here um basically from this view i'm sitting on the edge of the pines um looking at a prairie and as you can see the game trails moving throughout it um you know i'm just trying to set up in areas that those travel areas where they're basically they're going to be bedded in those pines and they're going to be headed towards those swamps um, for something to eat um as the wet season and dry season vary each year. Uh, this will determine uh, setup as well, because basically, if it's a drier year, uh, I might be set up closer, or I might be more on top of those cypress, as opposed to being hugging up on top of the pines. This is just uh, an example of 
nice buck running through a prairie headed towards the cypress. They love walking along the edges of, of those cypress domes. So I just wanted to play you guys a little video I found on my phone that I think illustrates what the habitat is like down here. One thing you can't see from the video is just how hot it is. It can be pretty brutal, especially in archery season. You could be talking about 90 degrees and high humidity with a heat index of 100 something. There's really no such thing as scent control down here besides playing the wind. Just gotta know which way the wind's blowing and where you think the deer are gonna be coming from. Definitely got a be in good shape to hunt this place and pack plenty of water because you can get in trouble quick if you're not hydrated. And that's pretty much it. I'll hand it over to Mark now. Thanks Richard. Um... Hi everyone, my name is Mark Barton and uh, I run a YouTube channel together with a good buddy of mine, Danny Perez, called Swamp and Stomp. And this YouTube channel is focused on hunting in Florida and more specifically uh, our stomping grounds down here in South Florida that uh, Richard was talking quite a bit about. Uh, so the purpose of the second half of this presentation, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, you know, how you would go about uh, coming down to Florida um, and hunting whitetails and uh, the different uh, public land opportunities uh, that exist down here. Whenever we head to another state or a different area to um, chase whitetail deer, generally speaking, what we're looking for is uh, you know, new terrain, new habitats to explore. Uh, new challenges to overcome and, and a new species, or in this case, a subspecies to pursue. In South Florida, the Seminole Whitetail offer all of these things. Uh, here's a nice buck that Danny harvested earlier this season. Um, and even though these deer are quite small in size, uh, they offer some you know pretty unique opportunities uh, to, to challenge yourself. And so if you're into that kind of thing, you might be interested in, in coming down to Florida to chase after these whitetails. One of the downsides of wanting to come to Florida to hunt whitetails is that there's not a lot of uh, resources available to learn about how to approach these whitetails. Uh, there's a few YouTube channels uh, like my own. Um, there's also a few good podcasts. You could check out Chasing Tails Outdoors. Those guys do a great job. Um, and there's a number of Facebook groups uh, with a lot of hunters that are more than willing to help out uh, a newcomer or, or someone from out of state. Um, but for the most part, the, uh, the media that's being put out about hunting in uh, other parts of the country are just really not applicable to South Florida. And so the point of this presentation is to sort of give you a good starting point uh, if you are interested in coming down here. Despite popular belief, there's actually a lot of public land that can be hunted in Florida. And here we have a map of the entire state. Um, and all of these green parts are uh, wildlife management areas that are available to public hunting. Um, as Richard mentioned earlier, the peak rut times throughout the state vary quite a bit. And because of this, these wildlife management areas are generally managed individually. Um, the season dates can can vary as well as a number of other restrictions. With this in mind, it's probably best if you're going to come down here to pick one or two areas that you're interested in um, and study the rules so that when you do come down here and it's time to harvest a deer that you don't uh, make any mistakes and harvest something you're not supposed to. Um, you can find the rules in the brochures which are on uh, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission website, which is myfwc.com. When you look at those brochures, there's a few uh, pretty common variations that you'll see between areas. Um, and these are the most common things to look for. Now, I'm not saying these are the only things that change, but 
uh, for the most part, um, you know, these are the things that you really need to pay attention to. Here we're zoomed in on the, the southern portion of the state. Uh, this is zone A um, and a list of all of the wildlife management areas in this area. And they're shown on the map here in gray. And as you can see, they make up a pretty large portion of the state. I'm just going to overlay Lake Okeechobee on here uh, just as a point of reference. But most of these uh, wildlife management areas you can hunt deer on. And there's a few of them that I'm just going to remove from the list. Uh, these are um, small game hunt areas or uh, waterfowl areas that you can't pursue deer. Um, of the ones that remain, uh, there are quite a few of them that are quota hunt areas. Um, and I've put an asterisk next to those. And, and that means that you need a specific permit to be able to hunt them. Um, and you can actually apply for those permits for free uh, by going to the MyFWC website or downloading the app. Um, you just have to read about when the uh, application periods are and, and you can apply for free. You'll notice that I put a double asterisk next to Picayune Strand and that's because it's not always a quota area. It's um, uh, only, only during archery you don't need a quota or a permit. During the rest of the time you'll need a permit. Now, for the most part, uh, all the, the different habitat types that Richard discussed earlier are going to be found in pretty much every single one of these, uh, but most of them will be dominated by one type over the other. Um, and just to give you an idea of, of what those dominant habitat types are, I've color-coded them. Um, there's also two public land areas that are not shown on the map or listed here. Um, and that includes the southern portion of the Kissimmee River, uh, which technically is part of Zone C, but there is a small portion that's down here in Zone A. Um, and then Lake Okeechobee is a uh, an unmanaged public land area that you can hunt. Um, and the same rules apply in there that apply on private land. Hunting has always been a pretty important part of South Florida's history, um, especially hunting in the Everglades. And as Richard mentioned, some of these ridge and slough habitats that you find out there can be pretty deep. Um, and you're definitely not going to be able to get to some of these tree islands where the deer are congregated on foot. And so a lot of people like to hunt these areas using uh, airboats. And this is still a, a pretty popular method of hunting down here in South Florida. There's uh, some other vehicles that people might use to hunt these areas, and one that might not be as well known is the swamp buggy. Uh, but this is still a very popular method uh, for hunting. And I found this pretty cool picture up in the top right of two swamp buggies making their way through a cattail marsh. And it looks like one of the buggies has a pretty nice buck sitting on the back of it. Nowadays, people still use swamp buggies quite a bit, but they've gotten quite a bit more sophisticated and uh, also quite a bit larger, as you can see on the, the bottom left. Another vehicle that's uh, pretty cool that you can use down here in South Florida is a, a full track, which is essentially a, a small tank with a, uh, with a platform on top that you can shoot from. And though most public lands don't allow these anymore, there are still a few places you can go to hunt in this style. A lot of times together with these different vehicles, you'll see people using dogs uh, to drive deer and, and push them out of some of these hard to reach habitats to be able to get a shot at them. But obviously uh, these methods require quite a bit of uh, equipment and uh, a lot of organization. And so if you're traveling to Florida to hunt, uh, these might not be quite as accessible to you. If you're coming from out of state, you're probably most likely to um, approach hunting whitetails in two ways. Either you'll be still hunting, taking a walk through the woods like this guy, or uh, using a tree stand. And uh, tree stand hunting is my favorite way of approaching whitetails. And that's just simply because down here in South Florida, the vegetation can be so dense um, and it pretty much never dies down. It's, it's always gonna be thick. So when you're standing on the ground, uh, it's often pretty hard to see very far, and it can make it really difficult to sneak up on deer. But uh, from a tree stand, you can see quite a bit further, and 
um, it gives you the uh, the advantage uh, that you need to get close enough to a whitetail to get a shot. Before you go run off and book your tickets to come hunt down here in South Florida, uh, there's a couple warnings that I should probably issue first. Um, and the first being the mosquitoes. Uh, they can be pretty brutal down here in South Florida. Uh, a lot of guys like to wear head nets, uh, bug suits, spray themselves down with bug spray, run multiple uh, thermocells at once. Uh, anything you can do to keep them off of you. I personally don't mind it too much. I just kind of let them have at it, and they kind of tend to stop once the sun comes up, but uh, not everybody's as crazy as I am. One thing I do try my best to look out for is uh, the sun. As Richard mentioned in, in early season, it's pretty common to have days that are over 90 degrees, and here's a picture of me looking pretty miserable after... Uh, making a poor decision to sit in a tree where I didn't have much shade in the morning. Um, here in the afternoon, I found a tree with a little more shade. Um, and you can see I'm sitting in a palm tree, and these, these usually tend to offer a little canopy over your head that keeps you cool. Um, but this is really important to consider when you're hunting in South Florida, whether you're on the ground or in a tree stand, is, you know, where is there going to be shade? Uh, where can I get a good breeze? And how can I keep cool? Simple things like wearing uh, light moisture wicking and breathable clothing um, or even just taking off your boots uh, to let your feet cool down uh, can help. And really just anything that you can do to keep yourself cool and comfortable is going to help because uh, you can overheat pretty quickly uh, and get dehydrated. And you definitely don't want that to happen. There's also a number of dangerous animals that uh, you should be aware of before you come down here. We have uh, lots of Florida panthers and black bears, especially in the southwestern parts of uh, Florida. Uh, we also obviously have alligators, and, and that should come as no surprise to you. But what will surprise you is just how far away from water they'll go. And even though you might be walking around in an area that's pretty dry and you would never expect to see an alligator there, uh, they can be there. And so being aware of your surroundings and, and watching where you step uh, goes a long way in these parts. We also have wild boar. And, and even though you won't see very many, many of them in the areas where uh, black bears and panthers are uh, abundant, they're still around and as you can see from those tusks you really don't want to be on the receiving end of those and with that in mind it's worth mentioning that uh, if you are going to be hunting here in south florida you are legally allowed to open carry a sidearm uh, while participating in hunting activities um, and it's definitely not a bad idea to consider doing that we also have a variety of venomous snakes down here in south florida and these three are probably the most common ones that you'd run into. Uh, in the top left, you got the cottonmouth. Uh, bottom left is the uh, eastern diamondback. And, and on the right, we have the um, coral snake. And uh, you can probably imagine that if you have a close encounter with one of these, your sidearm's probably not going to help you out very much. Because by the time you realize that you're too close, it's probably already too late. So, um, again, you know. Being aware of your surroundings and watching your step goes a long way in these parts. Um, and I spend a lot of time out there, and I've never had a close encounter with them, I, but I see them all the time. So now that I've gone and scared you all away, and you're thinking, why the heck would I want to go down to Florida to hunt deer, let me reel you back in, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the tactics that you might use to, to get after whitetail. First, we'll talk about some of the similarities between Florida and other states, and then uh, we'll talk about how they differ. So much like in other states, uh, deer tend to congregate around areas of high diversity or transition areas between different habitat types. Uh, just like in this image here, you see uh, two deer moving along the edge of a tree line um, on a prairie. Um, just like anywhere else, deer in South Florida have to feed. So if you can find an area that deer have been feeding in, 
uh, chances are that they're going to come back there. And just like up north, if you find an area where they've been feeding and then you're able to find a bedding area nearby, chances are that they're going to move back and forth between those areas and spend quite a bit of their time in those bedding areas. And of course, if a deer has been in any area, they're going to leave some sort of sign behind that's going to tell you they were there, how frequently they're there, and whether you should spend your time hunting in there. But beyond that, uh, everything is different. Up north, a lot of people like to focus on bedding areas, but down here in Florida, that can be a lot more difficult just because the vegetation is, is always dense, it's always lush, and there are so many areas that look like a potentially good place for a deer to bed down. Um, and realistically, bedding areas in, in South Florida have a lot more to do with the tactical advantage that they have in terms of escape routes um and uh, uh and wind directions than anything else so for the most part uh most florida hunters tend to uh, not really be paying attention to where a deer might bed and instead are uh, thinking about where they might um, go to feed and you might be thinking well that's easy just go find a cornfield or a soybean field that's near some public land and then focus on trails that go in and out of that um, and uh, you can forget about that approach down here in South Florida uh, you're really not going to find any agricultural fields near public lands um, and those that you do find are probably going to be sugarcane and that's not really a favorable crop for for whitetail so you won't really find them hanging out there instead you're going to be focused on natural food sources and one of the uh, sources that a lot of Florida hunters tend to focus on is acorns. Uh, if you can find a, an oak patch like what you're seeing here where there's uh, even just one tree that's dropping acorns pretty consistently, chances are the deer are going to be moving through there um, and you should probably start looking around for some sign. There's also a number of other food sources that deer might focus on. Uh, there's a variety of fruit bearing plants in South Florida. Um, up in the top left here, we have uh, cocoa plums, which are actually quite delicious. If you ever find them, you should try them. Um, beauty berries is uh, another uh, berry that, you know, deer really uh, like a lot. Uh, down here, we have um, palmetto berries, and the hogs really like these. Deer will eat them as well, but the hogs really love them. Um, and then these right here are myrtle berries that you'll find a little further north um, in zone A. Um, around Lake Okeechobee, uh, in some of the oak hammocks, you might also find persimmon, uh, which deer absolutely love. Um, but down south, you're not going to see it very much. And you may also run into some citrus trees. Um, but I've never really had much luck focusing on deer hunting around citrus. But it's always worth taking a look to see if there's some sign nearby. I think this picture is probably a perfect example of why uh, spending a lot of time looking for scrapes in South Florida is probably a giant waste of time uh, because for the most part they're going to be underwater. Um, but if you look right past this deer you can see there's a rub right behind him and in fact it looks like there's a cluster of trees that have been rubbed up there. Um, and rubs are something that we tend to focus on a lot to try and figure out where the bucks are hanging out. Some of the trees that you'll often find deer rubbing on are uh, young pines, like the one shown in the picture to the left. Um, they'll also often rub on uh, young cypress trees, so they have pretty soft bark as well. And uh, they'll also rub on uh, sapling oaks, or that might be a myrtle bush. It's, it's kind of hard to tell from uh, this image, but uh, generally speaking, you know, if it's on the edge of a prairie on a tree line, um, and you find some young trees, it's good to keep an eye out for a rub. You hear a lot of talk in the hunting media about scent control and trying to reduce the amount of smell that you produce. And unfortunately, in Florida, it's just impossible. You're basically sweating from the moment that you step out of your car until you get back into it. But as you can see from this picture, it shouldn't really stop you from being able to harvest a buck. 
and there's a number of ways that you can deal with your scent. If you're going to be hunting from the ground, it's probably not a bad idea to get yourself a good wind indicator um, just to make sure that you're working your way into the wind. And this can obviously be pretty helpful if you're in a tree stand as well, but one of the tactics that Danny and I have found helps a lot when you're in a tree stand is just getting your tree stand as high up the tree as possible. So don't be like the guy on the right. Um, be like the guy on the left. Um, and as you can see from, from this image, both of these guys are using climbing tree stands. Um, and this is a really popular uh, type of tree stand in South Florida because the majority of the trees are palms and pines and they don't really have any branches on them. Uh, on the lower portions and uh, they're pretty uniform in width so you can get way up them with a climbing tree stand. Uh, one thing you definitely don't want to copy from this guy on the left is the way that he's pulling up his gun because uh, it's pointing right at him so don't be like him in that regard but definitely do get your tree stand as high up in the tree as you can. Anyway, I, I can talk about hunting whitetail and tactics that you might want to use uh, in Florida for hours, if not days. Um, and, you know, if you want to hear more about that stuff and you're interested and you have questions, please go check out uh, our YouTube channel. Again, it's called Swamp and Stomp. Um, and uh, that's all I got for you for now on this presentation. One thing I just wanted to add on the end real quick is that if you do end up coming down to South Florida and you do end up shooting a deer, uh, if you can't find blood or you lose blood and you're struggling to find your deer, uh, keep in mind that this Florida heat can uh, spoil the meat on your deer pretty quickly. And so it's really important to get to your deer as quickly as possible. Um, so don't hesitate to reach out to a, um, a tracker uh, with a dog. And you can go on the Florida Blood Trailing Network on Facebook, which is a great resource, and uh, post on there, and somebody will come out and track your deer for you for free. Um, obviously, a, a tip is welcome, but uh, this is a free resource that you know everybody should be able to take advantage of, so don't hesitate to use it. And with that, on uh, behalf of Richard and myself, I'd like to thank everybody for listening to our presentation about these uh, seminal whitetail and this uh, really cool hunt that we have down here in South Florida. Um, and if anybody has any questions that they think of uh, later on that they want to ask us, we've put our contact information down at the bottom here. Um, and with that, we'd be happy to take any questions that you guys have.